morning all and a warm welcome to uh, this peatland restoration delivery grant uh, webinar um, it's great to see so many uh, people turning up uh, my name is uh, peter jones and i work on uh, peatlands uh, in natural resources wales and i've got uh, my two co-presenters uh, are uh, Dr. Rosswyn Leonard from the National Peatland Action Programme and uh, Anne Wen Hughes from NRW's grants team and there are other uh, NRW colleagues on the call. Um, we'll be, uh, this is around about an hour long in uh, three thirds. So the first third will be uh, myself and Rosswyn talking about the Peatland programme and how this uh, this grant opportunity relates to it. And then our colleague uh, Anwen will talk to you in a bit more detail about the grant itself. And then the final third is a question and answer session. The first two thirds uh, will be recorded and we've started recording now. The final third where you have an opportunity to ask questions will not be recorded, but our questions uh, will be stored as a FAQ uh, fact sheet. And if you've got any uh, subsequent queries that occur to you after the meeting has finished, do please um, uh, direct those to the um, to the web address that will come up on the final on the final slide. Um, there is there will also be a Welsh language version of this webinar and there is a live webinar at 2 p.m. this afternoon um, in the medium of Welsh as well, if uh, you would prefer that. Um, I just mentioned at the very beginning, uh, it would help please if you could go on mute and ensure your cameras are, um, are turned off. Um, do please feel free to post a uh, chat as we're going along. We won't endeavour to answer that as we're talking. We'll store those until the end. So uh, you're just as at liberty just to make a note of the query and ask it and ask it then. OK, so with that, I think we're ready to make um, a start. So uh, next slide, please. Great, thank you. So um, the uh, the kind of uh, rationale really for this grant is um, summarized quite nicely in this slide um, which shows um, a good condition peatland on the left with the full range of uh, organisms on that peatland that we associate with these habitats in good condition and in this state uh, this peatland will be um, either a very weak uh, net um, emitter or more likely weak weak net sink for greenhouse gas emissions and a, and a relatively strong net sink for carbon dioxide. So this means that it's contributing uh, actively to the climate change emergency. Um, conversely, uh, a peatland in poor condition, and that's summarised by this eroded peatland on the right, um, uh, will be of uh, very much less value from a biodiversity point of view. The, the characteristic range of animal and plant species will have been very kind of disrupted really by this erosion or indeed by many other forms of degradation. And this will be a strong net source of greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere from the uh, ancient stored peak profile. So the importance of trying to shift as, as much of our damaged peatland resource from the right hand image to the left hand image is 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 kind of you know nicely summarized by this uh, slide. Next, please and is strongly reflected in government um, policy. So our current uh, peatland policy uh, ambition from um, government is to uh, ensure our peatlands with semi-natural vegetation are subject to favourable management and also to restore um, uh, uh, our most modified areas of peatlands as well with these two um, current initial sets of targets. And this ambition speaks very strongly to uh, the two declared uh, emergencies in Wales, the nature and climate emergency. And as, um, as many of you will know, um, our response to these two emergencies is particularly nicely linked and coupled in the case of peatlands because good for nature really does mean good from a carbon point of view um, as well. And other policy areas which are in support of this are of course the, um, the net zero Wales uh, work uh, with policy 72 directly relating to the National Peatland Action Programme of which this grant is a part. Uh, next please. 
So in terms of um, implementing this policy, the primary um, reaction on the part of uh, government has been to uh, fund NRW to set up the National Peatland uh, Action Programme with an annual investment of the order of a million pounds per year until 2025 and with a target restoration management area of 600 hectares per year. And this is being achieved through a wide range of delivery mechanisms, including direct work by the programme staff um, uh, our, ourselves, um, but also critically through the activities of partners uh, funded through a range of grant mechanisms, including, hope, we hope, this current one. Next slide, please. I think it's a little bit of a lag. Uh, next slide there. Thank you. Great. So the published uh, plan, which is available on our uh, website, um, has six uh, main priority action uh, themes, um, all of which uh, relate directly to the main context of peat um, erosion in Wales. And um, in any application for this grant fund, we would be looking for evidence that the um, activity in question was going to be addressing one or more of these priority action themes. And we'll just talk very quickly about each of those uh, next, please. So firstly, we have uh, peat erosion. Uh, which, although relatively localised in Wales, um, is very dramatic where it occurs and leads sometimes to whole scale loss of the of the peat body, which may have uh, developed over um, multiple thousands of years uh, with both the release of all that stored carbon back into the environment, um, as well as greatly degrading the habitat uh, upon which uh, you know the peatland species and animals occur. Next slide. And this can be on quite a large scale. This is um, um, a drone image of, of a peat erosion area uh, with all the remaining little bits of peat invisible as, as upstanding clumps of habitat and with a great deal of bare peat uh, in between. Next. Uh, then we have um, peatland drainage, which is often quite closely related to the measures that we might use to um, address erosion. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, our work to uh, counter that, and these are images um, from our partners in uh, Banai Brecheniog, um, our response to this is usually to try and, and raise and stabilise water levels as close to the surface to help resaturate um, adjacent areas of peat. And um, very often we expect this to have um, uh, associated uh, benefits in terms of um, uh, reducing flood risk uh, to a degree down slope. Next, please. Uh, peatland drainage is widespread throughout Wales. All sorts of different forms of it occur, uh, um, and including really quite deep ar arterial drainage um, features such as, such as the one shown in this image. Next, please. Uh, then we have um, a fairly broad ranging priority action theme relating to um, improving um, the sustainability of the way in which we manage our degraded upland peatlands. Uh, next slide. And a lot of these peatlands are very strongly dominated by um, uh, one or a few problematic species that become overly abundant when the peatland has been damaged by past um, uh, drainage or indeed current drainage uh, and burning and the one in question here is purple moorgrass millennia which um, can, can become uh, you know hugely abundant but which uh, can to a degree be reversed through through hydrological management but also through um, uh, better grazing regimes next slide and uh, this is a, 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 a photo of a peatland where uh, some mowing was employed to then uh, enable uh, a, a sort of better follow on grazing regime. Next slide. Uh, and of course, a very important part of this um, relates to grazing and uh, the use very often of, of a more mixed grazing regime um, involving larger grazing stock, in this case, uh, Welsh black cattle, but also ponies potentially. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and of course, uh, really quite large scale um, hydrological 
uh, restoration of upland peatlands uh, is being actively considered and in many cases used. And this particular case shown in this image is uh, use of a technique called contour bunding, which is used to uh, step up level water levels over a wider area than is normally possible through um, through grip blocking alone. Next slide. Of great importance um, in Wales are our very many often fragmented lowland peatlands and uh, these are widely scattered on uh, uh, either side really of the central kind of upland spine of Wales wherever you live in Wales you're not going to be very far away from uh, a lowland peatland and the pressures these places face uh, often relate to the abandonment of grazing coupled with um, drainage and uh, very often nutrient enrichment and we're very keen to uh, as with all our priority action themes to encourage a wider spread of, of uh, restoration activity across these these places next um, forested peatlands this is uh, number five of our priority action themes um, peatland uh, forestation was widely undertaken in wales in the post-war uh, period and uh, is very often accompanied by drainage and we have uh, an ambitious program already going on um, within within the national peatland action program to uh, restore a forested um, peatlands and uh, a, a great deal of scope for continuing continuing this activity through through grant aided support uh, next slide uh, and the challenge associated with restoring peatlands is often quite profound so this is is commonly the state um, in 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 which uh, forested peatlands uh, come into restoration once uh, clear fell has taken place. So uh, there are there's a fair amount of brash left. There's upstanding uh, tree stumps left, and there are all sorts of um, uh, uh, drainage features in place which really need to be counteracted if we're to rewet the uh, the peatland surface. So these are always quite a quite a sort of technical challenge to restore, but there are some very good um, techniques now in place across Wales, both led by um, NRW and our and our many partners. Next slide. And then finally, um, the, the, the last of our priority action themes concerns um, these uh, peatland areas that no longer support really very much in the way of uh, semi-natural peatland vegetation. They're usually deep drained and the bit I'm talking about here is really on the right of this image. Uh, these are uh, emitting really very large amounts of uh, greenhouse gases to the atmosphere and have been uh, quite, quite severely damaged and uh, we're certainly looking to expand our, our influence uh, into these places as uh, time goes on. Uh, and I think I hand over to Roswin at this point. Thank you, Roswin. Diolch. Diolch, Pete. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just talk through some of the, how the priorities that Pete just outlined feed into this um, current grant opportunity. Um, so following uh, feedback from the first couple of years of the National Peatland Action Programme, uh, we've decided to launch this uh, delivery grant. So this is a grant that will enable individuals and organisations to reverse habitat loss and improve the condition of Welsh peatlands with grants between 50,000 and 250,000. Uh, the grant is primarily aimed at undertaking restoration activities to address one or more of the MPAB themes that Pete has just spoken about. Um, so in previous years, we've had competitive grants that um, are to develop peatland restoration proposals. And this grant is to actually deliver action on the ground. So it's to, to make things happen on the ground to restore the peatlands. Um, the restoration work needs to happen between autumn 2023, so autumn this year, and January 2025. So it's slightly longer than a year and should give sort of a portion of two winters to deliver the work. Uh, so who can apply? Individuals, public sector organisations, registered charities, universities or other higher education institutions and research institutions. Um, third sector organisations or private sector organisations. What we do ask though is that the lead applicants have to either show evidence that they've delivered at least one peatland restoration project in the last decade 
or provide confirmation that they've got technical support from someone who has experience of delivering peatland restoration and can provide that sort of technical on the ground support. Uh, so, um, as I've said, this grant is targeted at action on the ground, delivery on the ground and making a change for either or both of the carbon um, and biodiversity elements of the benefits of peatland restoration. So the activities need to address one or more of the impact priority themes that Pete just spoke about and can be found um, in the published um, plan on our website. Um, <clears throat> And then a bit about the technicalities of the funding. So if access, access improvements are required to enable the works to happen, we've capped that at 15% of project total costs. Um, direct job costs, equipment, contractors, consultants, one-off professional fees, only those that are directly associated with making the restoration happen are eligible under this, um, under this grant. Um, there's a flat rate for overheads um, for, and of direct project staff costs um, for most projects. Also accept full cost recovery as long as it's fully demonstrated and evidenced. And it's only the staff costs that are related to the delivery of the capital restoration works that are eligible. Uh, so. Costs that are not eligible include uh, rev any revenue costs that don't contribute to delivering the capital works themselves, uh, capital restoration that doesn't deliver any of the MPAP priority themes, things like site visitor information panels um, and boardwalks would not be eligible. This is all about restoration delivery on the ground. Uh, survey and monitoring that are not linked to the capital restoration is not eligible. And we ask that you sort of really consider any sort of tree clearance or scrub clearance or anything that's sustainable management that doesn't have a sustainable element to keep that going. So if it was tree clearance without any follow up of grazing or hydrology, that would be looked upon unfavorably. Um, we won't be funding your organization's core activities, so only activities that are related to this capital project would be would be eligible. Um, ongoing of management and maintenance works, works outside of Wales, funding commercial or profit making activities, maintenance costs on public rights of way. Um, so there's there's a list there, and all of that's available on the website as well for you to to look at. So here's a quick timeline um, of the grant. So the grant was launched on the 31st of March 2023. Uh, the closing date is the 1st of July 2023. Uh, the estimated grant award date is uh, September 2023. The, um, there's a, there's, there are two deadlines for this grant and one is the uh, 20th of March 2024 where we expect 30% of the overall grant value to have been spent. And then by January 2025, we expect the full and final claim. So the grant re uh, recipients will be expected to measure and provide the hectares of restoration delivery expected or uh, to be on a trajectory to recovery. The GIS recording of any peat depth data GIS recordings of all interventions according to MPAP's reporting protocol um, as a minimum, and there will be other sort of standard grant reporting requirements as well. And as part of your application, please specify the um, hectares restored as uh, expected um, from, from the project in part of the sorry, in part of the project description of your application. Uh, so applications from all areas of Wales are eligible. Um, applications outside of Snowdonia National Park and the Brecon Beacons National Park will receive a slightly higher scoring in the scoring process and um, consideration for which projects are being funded. And 
And then from um, lessons learned from previous grants, I thought I'd share um, some of these today as well. So please mention other funding that could be perceived as double funding. Please check for constraints that can't be resolved within the term of the grant. Um, this has happened in the past where grants have fallen through because there was a, a you know a major constraint and please consider or take advice from the partner organization that has experience of delivering peatland restoration whether whether any of your constraint, constraints are likely to be an issue within the time scale of this grant if you have backup sites um, please include these in your application but clearly define which ones are priority and backup because this means that they can be assessed all in one go instead of needing to be reassessed if you know, constraints mean that you need to change plans. Uh, please don't try and blend multiple sources of NRW funding through separate streams. And if you've got any concerns about this, please contact the uh, grants team in advance and where you think there may be any perception of blending or double funding, please clearly outline um, the separation between um, any multiple projects. Um, if you're planning to undertake work on NRW land, the um, National Peatland Action Programme won't be able to provide full support on resolving any um, permissions or restoration design issues that you may have. And this goes for sort of other processes that NRW run as well, like consenting. So please make sure that you've got all of those either lined up already or in motion before you apply. And please report all data in the MPAP template and any delay in getting the data in the correct format will lead to delays in payment. And then, um, with any correspondence that you have with the grants team or MPAP about the grant, please could you use the words um, PEAT delivery competitive in all correspondence to avoid confusion with some of our other grants. And I think this is where Anne went. Um, wants to take over and explain the process. Thank you, Rosa, and good morning, everyone. I'm Anwen Hughes, and I work in the grants assessment and monitoring team. So I'll now take you through the various stages of our application process. So our grant process now follows Cabinet Office guidance which determines six key steps that will take us through the life of a grant, from design and development right through to final evaluation. We are currently in step two of this process, which is market engagement. Next. In order to make an application, you'll first of all need to request a reference number. To do this, you'll need to go to the Peatland grant page and included in the section underneath how to apply, there is a green button that you can click on to request your reference number. An email will then be sent to you by a grants team, which will include your reference number and links to the application form, templates and additional guidance pages. If you have any queries at any stage, please direct these to the grants inquiries email address as this will help us maintain appropriate separation, separation of duties and prevent de delays later in the process. Next. Our application form is tailored, so it will only ask you the relevant information based on partner type. There are four sections within the form and you can save information as you complete it, allowing you return to it, to it later. There will be certain fields where you'll be prompted to upload information such as the project plan and cost breakdown templates, as well as identif identification documents for individuals. The deadline, as Roswin mentioned earlier, is midnight on the 1st of July 2023, and we can only accept applications submitted up until that point. So part A of the application form will ask for your details, so name, address, and company information if applicable. If you're applying as an individual, then we'll need a copy of a recent utility bill. So that's within the last three months and certified copy of your passport or driving license to confirm your identity. 
you're applying as a third sector organisation, you'll need to upload your governing documents. Next. Part B is all about the detail of your proposal. So your project title, description of the work you want to do, and the project start and end dates, um, along with the amount being requested from us. In this section, you'll also need to upload location maps and complete a project plan template. Next. The part C is about how you will manage your project and you'll be asked to describe the main risks and how you plan to manage them. If you have any formal delivery partners, you will be asked to upload a copy of any signed agreements along with any other policies that may be relevant, such as equality and diversity or Welsh language policy. Next. The final part of the application is the detail around the funding arrangements and we'll ask you to specify if you're in receipt of or have applied for any other funding for this project. You will also be asked to complete and upload a cost breakdown sheet that will give us the full cost of the project and how it's to be funded. If you're a new, newly formed organisation of less than six months and do not have a set of accounts, we'll need the last three months bank statements or alternatively a letter from your bank confirming that you've opened an account. In this section, you'll also be able to upload your statutory accounts procurement policy and subsidy control declaration, if applicable. You will also need to declare any potential conflicts of interest. Next. It's really important for you to inform us of any conflicts of interest, as this will help us take the necessary precautions to ensure that our project assessors and panel are not conflicted in any way. An example of a conflict would be if you were related to an NRW employee or a previous NRW employee yourself. Um, failure to declare any conflicts is likely to cause delays to the process, which we clearly want to avoid. So as previously mentioned, you'll need to complete and upload a project plan in part B of the application form. The project plan is all about showing us the logic, the logic of how your proposal will ultimately deliver against the outcomes. I think our slides have gone amiss. There's something here. The activities are the things you'll be doing, which will be lead to the outputs, which are the actual products of the project. The plan should be grouped according to claim periods, which should then feed into the claim profile of your cost breakdown template. So for all outputs, you'll need to provide evidence. This could be in a form of an invoice, a report, copy of the consent, etc. And if successful, the outputs and evidence will form part of your award letter, along with the claim values and dates. Next. Ultimately, the work you do and the outputs that are produced should lead to longer term outcomes that will deliver for the programme. These outcomes may be longer than the life of the grant. This is an example of the cost breakdown spreadsheet that you'll need to complete. Um, this section is, is split into four tables. So the first table is for project expenditure. You'll need to detail the full cost of the project here using the relevant expenditure categories, which are listed in the drop down menus in the category column. If there's any expenditure that's not included within our categories, um, you can enter this in the cell which says other and then we'll, we'll choose an appropriate category when we assess the application. Um, and uh, NRW currently allows 15% of project staff costs to be claimed as overheads. If you believe your overheads will be greater, then please ask, ask us to provide you with an additional form. This will allow you to claim full cost recovery if approved. The next table is the project funding cash table which is where you would detail any additional funding you have or details of funding that you're aiming to secure to, to fund the project. So any amount detailed here when added to the amount being requested from NRW should add up to the total project costs in that first table. 
Whilst this grant does offer up to 100% funding, we will look favourably on any match funding that you can provide. Any volunteer time will need to be detailed in this, the third table, which is the in-kind section. You'll need to enter the roles against the headings of unskilled, skilled and professionally qualified. But please note that the headings relate to the role rather than the individuals themselves. The, the last part of this spreadsheet is, is the claim profile. And we'll review this as part of the assessments, um, making suggestions of uh, amendments if, if they don't appear feasible. Um, as a public body, we pay in arrears as standard. If you require payment in advance, please contact the grants team. Um, you should note that any requests for payments in advance will require an, an assessment of your need. Um, there's no guarantee that this can be accommodated. So when completing these templates, please ensure you familiarise yourself with the grant information pages so that your project plan and cost breakdown meet the specific requirements. For example, as previously mentioned, the size of the grant, so a minimum of 50,000 and a maximum of 250,000, and that there's a need for at least 30% of the grant value to be expended and claimed by the 20th of March 2024, and that your final claim date must be made by the 15th of January 2025. So the earliest your project can start is the 1st of September 2023, and it must be completed by the 1st of January. 2025. Next slide, please. So NRW's financial assessment is completed by NRW's grants team. It's tailored based on the partner type and includes standard due diligence checks, um, which is proportionate based on value and risk. We cover know your applicants, which may include checking a company status or reviewing identifi identification documents for individuals. Um, we'll review financial health, so this could include reviewing an applicant's accounts and undertaking credit checks. We'll also look at other sources of funding, so checking um, for both internal and external funding, ensuring compliance with the subsidy control regime. Um, and that we'd also look at areas of special concern so this will include reviewing any potential conflicts of interest. So project assessment. A minimum of two, once we've received your application, um, a minimum of two project assessors will be signed to each application and they will score each application based on a number of set number of questions and the scoring, which is um, I think is, which is available on, on the website. Um, there'll be a minimum criteria to meet and there'll be also additional weighting for, for location. An assessment panel will then, will then convene to discuss the assessments and to ensure consistency and rank all the projects by the scoring to make a final recommendation for funding. So if you need help at any stage of the process, if you send an email through to the Grants Inquiries team, um, they'll, we'll, we'll share the email address at the end of the presentation. Um, if you ensure that all the requests come through the, the Grants Inquiries team, we can forward that on to the relevant, um, relevant members of, of NRW to get a response to you as soon as we can. Please don't make any contact with any NRW staff directly because this this will delay the process due to our need to maintain separation of duties. So if your application is successful, we will send you an award letter via DocuSign. So this will go to the people who, um, who have the authority to sign as noted in your application form. So it's important to make sure that they're aware of the application so that they can keep an eye out for the award letter when it comes through. Um, they must sign electronically using DocuSign um, and you shouldn't start working on the project until this is fully signed and returned to NRW. 
So once we've received your signed award letter, we will then issue a welcome pack, which contains all the details you need to know about um, administering the NLW grant um, and also include the relevant templates. So, um, for example, the claim form, the transaction list and the progress reports that you'll need to complete as part of the claim process. And there'll also be information on there on how to use the NLW logo. You'll be assigned a grant delivery officer. This is usually someone with technical specialism or someone from your local NRW team. They can support you throughout the life of the grant with technical issues. You'll also be in touch with the grants team who manage the administration of the grants and do the fin financial processing of your claims. Any variation to your project must be requested. Your request must be sent to the grants team in advance um, and must be fully approved before implementing any any changes. And that, that completes my overview of the process. So handing back over to you now, Pete. Thank you.